It's showtime. It's showtime. It's showtime. It's Calling Chris Anderson in still in London. London. Yes, I'm calling her choir in Chicago. <laughs> I'm here in you know, Chicago. Well, you finally made it back. Yeah, I, um, I I was not here last weekend, I guess. I was in the hotel room in Albuquerque. Yes. It was great. Yes. Uh, welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help and assistance of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering a variety of history tours in Europe, the U.S., and the Pacific. Check it out at stephenambrosetours.com. And whether you're watching live, watching on replay, or listening on the HHH podcast, thank you for joining us. Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Oh, yes. Our guest today canceled. So some of you yeah. are like, why, what? But our guest today canceled. Why are we listening to these two? <laughs> no, this is it. What, I, he was going on top, top secret Ministry of Defense history information. So Yeah, right? I, we don't know. But not here That's what you said. Uh, so it's just going to be us and we've asked people questions or people have asked us questions and we're going to start with those and we yeah. invite you to ask questions raise uh, topics you know do whatever you want let's see if we can uh, can generate some heat here at history happy hour well, that's uh, we let us for a number of questions yeah we have a good start um let us know that you're here and what you're drinking and and, and Chris, what's the weather like in London? Should we talk really slowly Actually, to help fill up the hour? <laughs> well, it's been very cold, very seasonal here in London, but uh, it's it's starting to warm up. It's supposed to get like in the fifties this week. So. It's a and, and in I Chicago, think nineteen in Chicago, so a little warmer than it has been, no. but not too bad. No, nice. uh, oh. Do we have anybody? Is anybody? Is there, have there, has everybody left at this point? Chris, no, actually, there? No, no, no. Susan, Susan's joining us from Maryland, and, and Jean from Sugarland, Texas. Uh, Steve Smith from Washington State, and uh, Jean Templin, uh, and Chris. I hope, even though my team humiliated his football team this weekend, he might be you know off crying somewhere. Oh. Um, and, and David Picker, Ken, Brian uh, are on board from Charleston Air Force. Charleston Air Force Base. I see Lizzie Borden is here, yeah. and Ken Hatrup. Oh, and so. Brian Peacock. Uh, they you know, to... It's kind of funny, though. Like, most of the people that sent us questions aren't here, though, unless they're listening. Like... Well, I saw Craig Condon here. He sent us a question. Oh, okay, okay, good. And, uh, yeah, maybe some of the other people are, are just slow typers. Mm. Slow to that live typing. Stealth, uh, stealth watchers. Yeah. I want to mention um, that uh, Chris is not crying. Okay, it says uh, he, he's, he's just saying crying. that, Gene. He's saying that. I want to thank everybody who supports us on Patreon, especially our top shelf patrons. And Absolutely. where are they? There they are. Uh, and you can join this group or become a, a patron of some sort. It doesn't have to be at the top shelf level. By clicking on patreon.com slash history happy hour. Type those in. Join as a patron and uh, help keep the history tabs open. So, um, yeah. yeah. So uh, should we should we start the show, Chris? Uh, yeah, we can. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah, fingertips yeah, ready. Chris. The bar is open. Are you, are you, hmm. you, you're all quiet there, Chris. What did, did the thing, the intro play? I thought it played. It played here. Okay. Okay. I, 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 saw, I saw like, I saw, a, I saw a black screen and I saw two men in a wagon, but I didn't see like the. the <laughs> Guys, did the intro bottle. play? Uh, tell us, you know, we, we, <laughs> we, we don't, we don't really know. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to open my beer now because the show has oh, started sure. so, uh, yes. so we can start drinking. And so uh, we asked people uh, in advance if they had any questions or topics, and people emailed some in. So we'll start with those, but we do invite you. We don't have a script today or a guest. Um, uh, we just invite you to throw in your topics or questions that you have or your answers to the questions that we're trying to answer, and, and we'll see if we can't feature some of those in. But Chris, uh, the first uh, first question came up uh, from Sharon Peterson, and she says, "Initial mm -hmm. thoughts on the previews of Masters of the Air? Will it do justice to the book?" So there's a start. Well, I th 
Yeah, well, I, I just thought it was really. You know, so I like, asked um, the question, Hanks so I make you answer it. Yeah, I said that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Hanks and Spielberg, Hanks and Spielberg, obviously take a great deal of interest in my tour schedule, so they. They plan this series to coincide with my eighth Air Force tour, so I really appreciate it. Now, have um, you have you uh, consulted a lawyer about uh, suing them over this, or is, well, it, yeah, or is it good? You know, he'll probably send me a T-shirt. I'll be, I'll be fine with that. Yeah, I'm interested yeah. to see Elvis. <laughs> is, gonna Elvis is in this series. Uh, the actor who played Elvis is he in the Elvis? Because so, right, so, is the star of this. Oh, I, see, so. I didn't see. I didn't see Elvis. Okay, so I didn't see Elvis, so I don't know who the actor is, um, and I don't really have any plans to watch the series. So um, I am curious, though. Uh, I know Sharon asked about whether it will stay close to the book, and that's going to be difficult because um, Masters of the Air is sort of a, an overview history of the, the strategic bombing campaign. It's not about a specific unit. Um, and the two previous HBO series, uh, Band of Brothers and the Pacific, more so Band of Brothers, but they focus on one unit or a small group of people. Um, and so I don't know how they're going to do Masters of the Air. I have heard that um, it's going to be focused on the 100th Bomb Group, uh, which would be a fantastic story. Um, but for those folks who want to know, Wing and a Prayer is probably the best eyewitness book that focuses on the 100th Bomb Group. So it'll be interesting to see. I, 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 I don't know how, how to pull it off. I looked up uh, oh, just, online yeah. a few weeks ago. I, I, w I went in to, to just look at the cast, and all of the cast members, all of the roles that they're playing are real people. So okay. um, I think that they are clearly focusing on real individuals. And I seem to remember that one of the lead characters in this flies uh, however many missions and then is shot down and then is in a prison camp. And I saw some scenes like that in the trailer. So I mm -hmm. think they're trying to, whether they're staying with the book or not, they're trying to stay yeah. with the, with the truth of the, of the show. I look forward to seeing it. I would like to watch it. Yeah. So uh, I, I mean, I'm, I sure, I'm sure, I'm sure they'll stick. You know, all I saw on my Facebook news feed, the the graphics look good and the, the the pictures that i see plastered on the sides of buses all over london at the moment you know the uniforms all look good okay so, so we're obviously getting some kind of delay here between us so um uh we'll just have um, to kind of work our way through that uh, sharon has a second question chris would fdr have used nukes on japan yeah. or, or would he have instead uh spent time on a further firebombing effort that probably would have had the same effect the word drop on the bomb it's for the <laughs> word, word drop on the bomb uh after after once we have that technology after the bloodletting on okinawa word drop on the bomb i don't see anybody coming up with a different way to do it i was talking to somebody about this recently uh it was actually uh a gentleman who's a, a neurosurgeon and a nuclear physicist. And he was saying that the scientists who worked on the bomb, they thought that they were going to have some voice in whether or not it would be dropped. And he said it wasn't, they weren't upset that, oh, they had a voice, but it was just a little bit of a voice. They were upset that they had no voice at all. They were basically like the people who make a revolver right. who have no voice in whether you're going to fire the revolver. I, I don't see how our country spends the uh, you know, billions of dollars, and I don't know what it would be in today's money, a huge national secret effort for multiple years, and then says, um, oh, no, never mind, we're going to hold off. So they had, they had two. Um, we were just in Los Alamos. What was interesting was they had two bombs, and one, the uranium bomb, uh, they had done all the calculations. They were so confident it was going to work. It, they understood it completely. They didn't need to do a test. They didn't even have a test version of that. And that was the bomb that was dropped right. on Hiroshima. But the plutonium right. bomb that they made, which is the bomb that they dropped on uh, Nagasaki, they really didn't know if it was going to work. And that's why they did the test in, um, out in the desert to make sure at right. Trinity to make sure that that bomb was going to work. Okay. So they, they were going to use it, I think. Yes. But I, I noticed that uh, David uh, Picker also kind of asked a follow-up to that 
Um, he said, that is interesting, but more interesting is, would we have dropped the atom bomb on Germany if we hadn't already won the war? And I would say no, we would not drop the bomb on Germany, but... Uh, See, I Rick, think the answer to that is yes. I mean, I, I think I think the initial thought on the bomb was that um, we think the Germans might be trying to make it. We're trying to make it before they do. The Germans are our number one enemy. And I think if we had, I mean, I don't, it depends on what the situation is, but um, I think if we were looking at the no possibility of another year or two of war in Europe, mm. that we would have, um, I, I, I think the times were harsh and then we probably would have dropped the bomb. Uh, well, I tell people, and when we go to Tinian and I have them at the bomb pits, is two things. Uh, one, um, the Germans are Caucasian and the Japanese aren't. And number two, there are lots and lots of German American voters. So I don't think that we would have dropped the bomb on Germany. But that's a that's a you know one of those sort of things we're going to argue back and forth from about. But. So you want to pose a question to me? You can either either from oh, the that. list we have or from the ones that people are posting. I don't want to put you always first on the spot. <laughs> Stumble through an answer while you're yeah, well, that, gathering your thoughts. No, all right. So Rick, how is the new printing of the Ghost Army doing? <laughs> how, I, uh, threw, I should throw you an easy one. But I'll find a harder one. So you answer that. Yeah, no, that's from Gene. Thing. I see that Gene Franklin asked that, and and uh, so it it it's gone real well. Uh, it's sold well. They've they've uh, ordered more, so they sold out the ones that they purchased initially, and the publishers ordered. So we're at, in a second or third print run of the new edition already. So I mean, they're very small print runs, but it's going really well. And um, you know, of course, we've just gone through Christmas. Christmas is when you sell a huge percentage of the books you sell, so it's going to be pretty quiet now until May. So. I mean, at Christmas time, we were selling a few, you know, hundreds of them every week, and now we're down to selling, you know, twenty-five or thirty a week. Uh, but uh, you know, it's getting out there; it's going well. I've got a couple of boxes also back here, so I that I can take to events. Can I ask a follow-up? Can yeah. I ask a follow-up? To yeah. so, are you gonna? I want to see a picture, you know, because you have this. You have some kind of a, a pizza party happening on the Capitol soon. Um, <laughs> are you gonna? Are you gonna like just have a sandwich board? with like buy books here and walk around with a box of books. I want to see a picture of you on the Capitol steps selling copies of them. So Chris is referring to the fact, and actually we're sending a press release out about this tomorrow, that our gold oh, medal sorry. ceremony has been scheduled. Uh, oh. It's on March 21st at the Capitol. Um, and uh, working with the speaker's office on, on that. And uh, <clears throat> I accidentally sent an email to the wrong person because we we're going to do book sales the night before at a screening event. And I sent the email to the person in the speaker's office instead of to my planning person. And she's like, I really, we're not going to be selling books in the, <laughs> in the U.S. Capitol during this, you know, event. Yeah. And I was like, no, 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 no. That was the wrong person. I, could, you stage, could you stage a picture, though, like with the ghost? Around? I could bring the book <laughs> under my jacket and just whip it out and take a photo. All right. All right. I could. But I'm I'm not I going won't. to. Okay. I'm not going to. Right. We should probably ask a real history question now. Huh? Sure, ask me a real history question. Oh, okay. Well, so we, uh, um, Smith Sawwood had a, a whole list of of best, <laughs> worst, greatest. So I don't know if you want to do this as a one a one uh, one word answer, but um, greatest general of World War II. Uh, Eisenhower. Okay. I know that's your answer as well, so it's easy. No, it's not. No, it's not. No. Who's the greatest general of World War II? Bill Slim. Oh, okay. Commander in uh, in, in Burma. 14th Army, yeah. I forgot yeah, yeah. Army. Uh, he's pretty amazing. Doesn't make too many mistakes. So he's my fave. Okay. All right. And uh, greatest American general in U.S. history. Um, da, 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 da. Going to go with George uh, Washington. Ooh, okay. Well, you know, not not because he's a great general, not because he's great on the battlefield, but because he ends up being the the guy who pulls off this win against uh, against uh, Britain in what is a, essentially a pretty long shot operation. Mm. Well, I would I would say that uh, George Marshall is the greatest general. Okay. So. I really thought you would have put Eisenhower higher up there. Yeah, I just, um, in terms of, of yeah, it's, it's not an easy one, but I, I think in terms of a hands-on commanding an army, 
grinding it out officer, I think it's Bilson. I mean, one of the things you also have to keep in mind in that comparison, which is a real apples and oranges comparison of Marshall and, and Washington, is that Marshall has a <clears throat> has a general staff, has staff right. officers. Right. There's a whole cadre of people who are experienced in warfare. And Washington has a little bit of that, but not really very much. He's kind of making yeah. it up as he goes along. Well, I think any question, like when you're trying to do like a one word answer, you've got to, there have got to be some parameters, right? You know, cause... Okay. So let's keep going down that list. All right. So uh, the most interesting general of World War II to study. You go first. Well, I'm going to say Slim again because I'm, I'm, I'm all about Bill Slim. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. I, I'm gonna so 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 we should say that Smith's answer to all of these questions is Patton so far. Yeah, right. So it's not I've only picked Slim twice. So so I would say Patton is a pretty interesting general to study in World mm. War II. And so you know, so why do you why do you and Smith your both view. think that Patton is the most interesting general? So uh he's pretty interesting. Uh okay. Keep going. Okay. Um what do you consider to be the most innovative invention of World War II? So the pigeon-guided missile, even though it was never uh, actually put into combat, but I think that mm -hmm. that's a pretty um, – B.F. Skinner worked on it up in uh, Minneapolis during the war, and uh, they actually developed a missile, an anti-ship missile uh, that could um, – had a pigeon pecking on a screen to kind of guide that missile into the ship and eventually they they tested it it worked and it was not good for the pigeon because the pigeon <laughs> did uh did take leave of, of that but then eventually um they presented this to you know the higher ups or the people who had to approve it and they got laughed out of the room so we we didn't get to see what the pigeon guided missile would do okay well yeah so i mean interesting effective or interesting just interesting well it's innovative is the question okay so um uh Aircraft carriers made out of ice. Yes, that was suggested uh, by um, um, not Patton, not Patton he, at the conference in Quebec. Yes, and he fired a pistol off at his little yeah. test block of what's it, Pykrite? Right, the and then it goes bang, bang, around. bang around the room. <laughs> General staffs of the Allied powers are diving under tables. And people outside of the room are like, "What the hell is going on?" In there? <laughs> That's a hell of an argument. <laughs> are you shooting at each other? Yeah. So. Okay. Um, he's got three more on his list. Let's go for it. All right. Oh, this next one, boy, is this is a hot potato. <laughs> um, you can skip it if you want. No, no, no. People know where I think. Okay. Why Robert E. Lee is not the greatest American general? Because he chose the wrong side to fight for. You said he that wasn't much. an American general. He was a Confederate general. You made that. You said that much. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, mo moving on. Uh, why is Bannister Tarleton still the most hated SOB of the Revolutionary War? Because people don't know about Major James Weems, mm -hmm. who was another British officer who was probably the second most hated British officer of the uh, Revolution, also in the Southern Theater, also a cavalry officer who burned uh, a large swath of land, burned down uh, plantations, hung colonials, did all this stuff that people considered uh, wildly inappropriate, was eventually captured uh, and paroled. We did not like execute it, which I was surprised by. And then fascinating story. I just read this yesterday or nah, this morning you show in enough. a book about the swamp fox, Francis Ooh. Marion. But he eventually, he's wounded. He goes back to England. He's, you know, cashiered out of the army. And a few years later, he moves to the United States and he goes out and gets a farm in Ohio and he lives there until like 1830. And I'm like, how the hell did we let that guy back in? <laughs> but what's your answer? Why is Bannister? Well, I, well first of all, it depends on whose version of the, of the war. I, I don't know anybody over here that calls him the most hated SOB of the war. Could be the green uniforms also. Mm, yeah. Waxhaw's well, Massacre. Well, you know, I think to that point, I, <laughs> I think that a lot of the reason he becomes the villain is after the war, um, people are trying to digest what just happened. And they're trying to get everybody in the Carolinas to start liking each other once again. And there are a whole lot of atrocities committed by both sides in that part of the war. Uh, and it's really 
convenient to create the one villain. But a, a lot of the reaction of Tarleton and tar more importantly, Tarleton's men were, were, were responses to equally horrendous things committed by quote unquote patriots in the Carolinas. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a guerrilla civil war there. So uh, it's also important to remember that both Tarleton and Weems are very young. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. think Tarleton was over 30. Weems was 25 or 26. These guys, and they've, they've been in the army a while, but they're still pretty young people, um, you mm -hmm. know, and they still have all the sort of the passions of young people. Uh, you want to ask the last question there? Well, I, I just want to add something. Oh, yeah, I will ask the last question. Then I just want to, somebody asked about my, my buddy, Mr. Sloom, so I will mention something about that. But um, in spite of the political fighting, lack of money, frequently poor showing by patriot militias, how did we win the revolution? Uh, so one, George Washington mentioned him. Mm -hmm. Two, the French. The French. We didn't win the revolution by ourselves. The French entered, and we were very lucky in that the French fleet, which kind of was here and there and looking at fighting the British and maybe not fighting the British, and they have one battle where they defeat the British, and that's the Battle of the Capes, which is the battle that drives the British fleet away from Yorktown and means that uh, Cornwallis gets trapped at Yorktown. It is the only French victory uh, at sea over the British in like a hundred years. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, okay. they, they promptly, they bring their fleet down to the West Indies and promptly British whomp them and wallop them down there. But the French and George Washington. And number three. Go ahead. England just gets bored. They're just like, whatever, <clears throat> just whatever. And let's also not forget that uh, the colonies do break away, uh, but by the time the colonies do break away, it's become a world war, and Britain is now also fighting France, Spain, the Netherlands, and against all those opponents, they do pretty well. Yes. So and the other thing, uh, important. you know, they come away with some pretty sizable territorial and political concessions against people who they consider real opponents, which are other European powers. So. So also important to remember is how many colonies are there in 1776? 29. 20, yeah, 26, 27, something like yeah. that. So so we really want everybody to join the fight, we being the good guys, the Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, we, we invade Canada to try to convince them. And, and we took care of that, didn't we? We did invite them first, but then we didn't respond, <laughs> we invaded. And, uh, and we tried to get, but a lot of the, uh, these, these other colonies were the places that Britain was really making money from. The sugar colonies in the Caribbean. And, uh, and in many ways, the British uh, reduced, once the French entered the war, the British reduced the number of, troops and ships and resources for North America because they wanted to hold on to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So again, France. And the other thing, of course, that Britain holds on to is Gibraltar because that ends any further question about who's going to control Gibraltar, which controls the Mediterranean. Uh, completely unrelated to that, but uh, Susan and some other folks have asked me about uh, Bill Slim. Uh, best book about Bill Slim is called Master of War by Robert Lyman, and um, really outstanding biography. And we had uh, Ly uh, Mr. Lyman on the show to talk about another great book he wrote about um, Empires at War, about uh, the Pacific War, but with more of a British focus. But his his biography of Slim is, is really outstanding. So uh, we're just working our way through these questions that were submitted in advance, and then we'll get to the ones that you guys are posting. But David Thicker says, could you discuss the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 to 1871? It rarely gets discussed, yet I think it far more important than the scant attention it's given, considering how dramatically it changed the balance of power in Europe with the resulting realignment of alliances. The military, diplomatic, and geopolitical aspects are all fascinating, in my opinion. Among other things, it seems to have set the precedent for French military incompetence and German military dominance for the next two general wars. That was a question you wanted to take, wasn't it? You know, I, <laughs> I, I'm sure that I can respond to your answer on it, but you did say you had some place to go. Well, I, I, would, yeah, I would agree. I would agree um, that it's something that doesn't get enough attention. Um, you, know, I'm, you know, in brief, of course, um, there's yet another argument about who's going to be on the throne in Spain. Um, the Prussians are pushing a candidate. Louis doesn't like that. Uh, I'm sorry, Napoleon III doesn't like that because he wants France to be the big man in Europe. 
there's a little bit of a diplomatic kerfuffle, uh, out of which um, Napoleon III declares war on um, uh, Prussia and the North German alliance. So at this point, half of Germany is all in alliance together. Um, and because the French <clears throat> think that as they have always done, they will be able to easily beat uh, the Germans. And of course, surprise, surprise, within six months, uh, the Prussian or the North German alliance has gotten together and they've defeated, soundly defeated the French. They forced Napoleon III to abdicate. Um, and as a result of that, the rest of the German states join Prussia. Uh, and the king of Prussia is declared the Kaiser of all the Germans in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. And boy, howdy, does that and piss a lot. Everything works out perfectly after That's that. That's right. Exactly. Um, but also, this is the war that gave birth to airmail. Ah, yes, it is. You know, because because uh, Paris was besieged, and yeah. uh, the only way to communicate was balloons, bringing in mail and bringing out mail. Yes, and uh, so the commune, uh, of course, because Paris is besieged, and that's what brings down uh, Napoleon. Napoleon, and starts the Third Republic. Um, so it's uh, it's, it, and what it does really is it it of course it, it basically creates Germany because before that there is no Germany. Um, so did Bismarck? Uh, it, so did Bismarck see this all happening and kind of plan it or did he just sort of take advantage of things as they were happening? well see there's there's some debate about that and, and it's one of those we'll never really know for sure um many people believe that he kind of pushed all the buttons to get napoleon to react because um at this point he's gotten all of the northern german states to unify with germany but he he, he hasn't gotten bavaria uh, Saxony, these the southern German states to join this new German confederation. He wants to unify all the Germans, so he needs something. Uh, and if there's one thing that all these Germans, no matter where they are, can agree on is they don't like the French. So if we can get the French to declare war on us, um, there are others and the that... the French are happy to oblige. As, of course, they are. Um, course, for the French, it's it's 40, it's 50, 50 years after Napoleon. And I think right. they still kind of have this idea that they are the masters of Europe and they can, well, they, they are sally out and do whatever they want to do. Well, they are the masters of Europe because, uh, because before that, of course, you know, uh, they had always been in competition with Austria, but Prussia took care of Austria in 1866. So they, they are the big kids on the block. And that's why they feel threatened by Prussia because Prussia just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And they have a, they have a huge they have a huge empire most of the french empire is created under napoleon the third um so they are they are big that player. great mexico thing he did yeah we well, talked about that on the show America, too. yeah um so you know it, it's and i should say that uh mm -hmm. america and the american military think that the french are the greatest most powerful army in the world and our army is modeled on the french army the army that fights the civil war they modeled on the French army. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so the, the, the war ends uh, in a lightning, lightning quick campaign. Um, but I would say if Germany militarily wins the war, they certainly lose the peace uh, because they, in a very Germanic way, do whatever they can to just really piss everybody off. They So they declare Germany, they declare the Kaiser, uh, in all of mirrors in Versailles, so they, you know, they created <laughs> Germany in the very place that was at the heart of France. They take uh, Alsace and Lorraine, two French territories. Uh, they put an indemnity on France that just crushes them economically. Uh, and so, ever after, ever more after that, the French are always saying revenge, 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 and so. Leading up to revanche, yeah. revanche. Leading up to the outbreak of the Great War, they're saying revanche, revanche, and they're saying get back to the lost provinces. Uh, and also, I should say that a lot of that anti-German feeling and the fear of Prussian militarism starts after 1870 because the 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 Prussian terms are so punitive that people are shocked by this. Um, but of course, after that, uh, France is no longer. Um, the model to follow, Prussia is, and you know, you've, there's some important military developments as a result of that. Of course, the importance of mobilization, because one of the things that um, makes the Germans win is they are 
because they ha understand the railroads and they have a mobilization plan, they have 350,000 men in the field ready to go within two weeks of the declaration of war. And they're on top of the French before the French can do anything. So they rapidly defeat the French. Uh, and part, and so it's the mobilization, it's the understanding of the railroads. Uh, they also create a professional general staff, which nobody had Right, done. the general staff is... And that's critical. <laughs> huge. And so so after, after the war is over and people are saying, how did that happen? Every army in the world says, we have to have a general staff, a professional general staff. We have to have a mobilization plan. Um, and, and these are all things that you see... Uh, you know, for World War One, one of the things that I think is really funny is to show kind of the immediate results of this war. Up until the War of 1870, uh, if you looked at the American Army, like I said, uh, we copied the French. We wear kepis. We have zouaves. We do all these things. And the 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 U.S. regulations, I think it's for 1876 or 1878, are uniforms. We wear pointy helmets like the Germans. <laughs> 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 As I say about yeah, flight. that was the one thing we shouldn't have done. Yeah, I know. Uh, hey, so Bill Finnegan says, I know you have had many military history trips, tours. What is your most memorable one and why? Oh, and, yeah. I, and I got to say, what you're thinking about this, I got to say, we talked about this in advance, and I said it's sort of an easy question because it's just got to be one of the trips I've made, but it's a hard one because I'm not sure which one's most memorable. So I managed to ask it, so you get to go first. Okay. Uh, well, when I was at Braycourt Manor with uh, with um, Buck Hompton and Don Malarkey and Shifty, and we all I got to talk to them all at the same time, uh, but then watch them talk to each other. That was pretty amazing. About what and happened it, where? Yeah, yeah. I watch watch them sort that out in their own heads. You know. Uh, because I've it been was, there with you, and and you have a pretty good idea of what happened where, but which comes from them and from your conversations with Dick Winters, right? And Bill Garnier and and and, and lots of the other guys. But the the neat thing about it was I'd been there with you know I, everybody knows many 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 of the men, but to have those guys there all together at the same time, sort of bouncing off each other was was pretty special. <clears throat> and you. I think it's the first Ghost Army tour. Um, I've told this to many people, but uh, I mean, that was 10, 10 years ago. Uh, I had never, not only had I never uh, led a bus tour before, I'd never been on a bus tour before. Mm -hmm. So, and I, and I hadn't, okay, I'm going to reveal now, I hadn't visited all the places that we were going to on the tour. So I was really, Marilyn and I were really making well, More importantly, you hadn't awesome. visited all those places before you wrote the book? Uh, well, the places <laughs> we hadn't visited were not Ghost Army places. There were okay. other places that we were oh, okay. going to on the tour. But we also, we had with us um, a Gazo Nemeth, who was a very colorful uh, veteran of the Ghost Army and who told many, many stories. He really had people captivated on the bus telling stories. And there was a he was talking about this one time that they had um, they had gotten their hands on some alcohol, and then they were they 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 were worried about inspection or worried about what was going on. So they buried all this alcohol in a field, and then they went back to find it, and they couldn't <laughs> they couldn't figure out which field it was in, and they're all digging around trying to find the, the alcohol. Uh, but it was a very you know the experience of of being in Europe for the first time with a group. Uh, it was was pretty scary um, being there with a veteran and going to places where the veteran had uh, had had stories and stuff and I just wasn't exactly sure what they were going to remember we got to um, we got to uh, uh, this place in Luxembourg uh, in it's it's now part of the University of Luxembourg but it was a barracks building it had been a seminary it was a barracks building and um, and I knew Gezo had been had lived there I didn't know if he was going to remember anything. And we were standing out front, and he's like, I'll show you where the room I was in. And he like goes up the stairs, and we're following him. He's 93 or something. <clears throat> and he says, it's this room right here. And we like literally open the door, and it's a classroom, and there's a class going on. 
And we said, excuse us, but this gentleman's yeah. an American World War II veteran, and this is the room that he stayed in during World War II. And they were all like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that kind of uh, uh, spontaneous um, uh, reaction was, was pretty exciting and, and pretty memorable. Mm -hmm. It's your uh, turn to ask a question. Turn. Okay, so uh, uh, Heather Wattis wants to know, um, <clears throat> what was food like in the trenches of World War I? How powerful was a Hershey bar during World War II? Uh, yeah, um, don't have a lot of information about that, but I, what I will say is that food uh, is, is very, very important. And actually, if you go back, the, the, uh, the idea of canning food to preserve it, uh, is invented when Napoleon is a uh, leader of France and he is putting out uh, the word, you know, we, we need to find ways to preserve food to, to be able to make it available for the troops. And so this idea of preserved food is developed because of the needs of Napoleon's army. And it isn't Napoleon the guy who said uh, an army I mean, marches like, on its stomach. I'll, uh, add, I'll add to that, that. So it's clearly very important, although I don't have, um, um, you know, details on what the meals were like in World War I trenches. Well, I will say that, um, well, it depends, of course, you know, what year of the war and whose side you're on. But um, uh, I would say that in the British and Commonwealth armies and the French armies, the food was generally pretty good. Um, if, well, nourishing, not taste tasty, um, you know, uh, but there was a, certainly a lack of, you know, fresh vegetables and, and, and whatnot. But the, the British had certainly had um, canned food, canned rations. Uh, they had had experience of being on campaign, and so they were famous for having what was called bully beef, corned beef, or, uh, or or puddings and tins. And I can't remember the exact calorie count, um, but their calorie count was basically analyzed, and it was double whatever the minim bare minimum was uh, at that time. So th I, my point is that they're actually <laughs> thinking about how to sustain men in the field. And, and when America gets involved in the war, we have – prepared rations that are tinned. We also have um, emergency rations, they would call them. Uh, every GI's pack had, you know, a tin can with an emergency ration and coffee and sugar and, um, uh, you know, other things. So th they are aware of the need and they are aware of, um, you know, a daily ration and what the calorie count should be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the German army, of course, uh, starts out the same to a degree, uh, but then the blockade, goes into effect and they can't sustain that. So uh, you start to see the development or the creation of airsots everything. And airsots is German for fake. Uh, and so they have, you know, airsots you know, coffee, fake, airsots airsots, airsots, yeah, but then it turns into airsots cheese and airsots meat and, and airsots everything. Uh, and there's sort of a weird aside uh, that like at the start of the war, they actually have um, enough pigs to, to feed the army for, I can't remember, however many years it is that you know, they, they need to do this. Um, and then there there's something about the membrane of these animals that they need to help make dirigibles to, to launch bombing uh, of Britain, right? Because now uh, strategic bombing is starting to happen. So they kill all these pigs, uh, uh, but they can't preserve all the meat. So then, you know, the people just start starving. So by the end, of course, the Germans are, are just starving and they continue to starve after the war. Uh, and that's one of the things that kind of brings down the whole house of cards. But uh, it does really gas up this idea of, of substitute foods, right? So the whole idea of airsots, everything, is certainly in Germany, they develop that sort of to an art form. Um, you know, one of the uh, things that, uh, that just an interesting spinoff on that is in World War II, Coca-Cola is very popular in Germany uh, when World War II breaks out. Uh, and of course, mm -hmm. they're not getting shipments anymore of the uh, syrup from Georgia. <clears throat> and so they uh, develop uh, some kind of uh, a soft drink to replace that. And that is how Fanta gets developed. That mm -hmm. is Germany's kind of replacement for Coca-Cola. So um, I don't know if... Well, I don't think I'll they do still it. sell Fanta, but... Uh, well, I'm going to add another little historical, like, add-on to your add-on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, in Germany now, one of the popular drinks is called Afrikola. And that's, you know, Afra-K, Afrikola, yeah. Afrikola. Uh, but the logo for the cola is the same logo that was the logo for the Africa Corps, minus that little cross on the 
Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's your your turn to pose a question. Oh, okay. You're going to get another easy one, aren't you? Oh, FDR's leadership. Ha! All right. Uh, FDR's leadership is a really interesting topic. And, yeah. And it's confused because FDR is a guy who does not want to have, I mean, he's in the White House forever. And so you'd think he could really organize things to a T, but he, he likes disorganization and he has competing factions. He's a politician more than he is a manager. Um, and so there's always a certain amount of disorganization and everybody wondering what FDR is thinking and what he's going to do. And it always feels to people like whoever the last person he talked to is that they, they think he agrees with them, but the next person think he agrees with them. But I, I think that that ultimately, you know, FDR's leadership, even though his technique is pretty confusing, I mean, I think if you look at the results, uh, you know, he handles it pretty well. And one of the things that he does with the military, um, of course, he's got George Marshall, which is a really important thing. And, and, and he promotes, he makes George Marshall chief of staff, promoting him up way above many other people. So he puts a really good person in there. And then he to some degree, he leaves them alone, okay? Hitler and Churchill are way more involved in telling their militaries what to do and what 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 battle plans and, you know, tell me about this and tell me about that than, uh, than Roosevelt is. I'm always struck by the fact that when we're launching the invasion of North Africa in 1942, it's going to be in November 42, and Roosevelt says to George Marshall, you know, it'd be really nice if this happened before election day, because of course, Roosevelt has been coming in for a lot of criticism in the first year of the war, because we're not involved in it. So he wants American boys fighting, and that would be really helpful on election day in 1942. But he doesn't force that. He doesn't make that happen. He just suggests it. And in fact, the invasion comes a few days after the election, because uh, Roosevelt knew enough to to leave George Marshall alone and let him him handle that. So um, it's it, that's just a kind of a glimpse into FDR's leadership. I mean, you can dig a lot deeper, but that's a start. Yeah, well, and I, I I'm, I'm going to kind of throw a grenade into the room and shut the door and run away. But I, I would say that that Roosevelt is our greatest president, hands down. Uh, I don't have so, a door. I don't I don't think. Well, no, like, well, what about going on? Uh, no, I, I think that, um, you know, you look at people like Lincoln. Um, you know, so Lincoln, of course, had the Civil War to deal with. Um, hugely, obviously, a very important thing. Um, uh, uh, and Washington, of course, the father of his country. Um, but but Roosevelt has uh, not only the, the economic disaster uh, of the Depression to deal <laughs> with, but then the World War. So he's, he's dealing with a, a truly huge... Uh, events both domestically and internationally uh and i mean he's certainly a character we can never get our our hand our hands on totally but um he's but yeah, enigmatic like, i mean i think yeah. the more you read about him it's like when i first was reading about roosevelt which is really you know as a young person it's like you read about this tremendous relationship with churchill i mean they're bound yeah. together and then the more you read about that the more you realize that roosevelt is kind of pulling churchill towards him sometimes and then pushing him away sometimes yeah. and he wants to yeah. manage that relationship exactly the way he wants it yeah 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 no i mean it's, he's very he's a very hard person to understand and, and God knows historians really appreciate that because I'll keep writing books to try to figure it out. But, <laughs> right, it means there'll always um, be a market for a new yeah. FDR book. But I think it's, you know, yeah, it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's really hard to argue with the results, right? Um, exactly, exactly. Um, and so I, I so yeah, um, I'm going to and follow up. Can I keep, can you keep answering Ann's questions or are we going to? Yeah, you've got another question for me, throw it at me. All right, she says, what are your top picks for World War One books? I think this is actually Craig Condon. I think I made a mistake. In oh, the, the unison. So, all right. Well, there you go. I so corrected Craig, it on mine, apologize. but I didn't correct it on yours. No, you didn't. All yeah. right. So, all right. Sorry. Top no picks for World War One books. So, I really like, I'm looking at my World War One shelf. Uh, uh, I really like To End All Wars uh, by Adam Hochschild, who was on our yes. show talking about Absolutely. another book. I think it's yeah. a very, um, you know, it's not 
it's a very specific view. It's kind of a view of a pacifist uh, writing about World War I, but he's got a lot of great stories in there and, you know, sort of starts out with the fact that one of the most important, uh, you know, one of the commanding generals, um, uh, you know, in, uh, in France, one of the British commanding generals, his sister was the leader of the anti-war movement. Uh, and so it sort of starts with that. Uh, and that's quite fascinating. And I think there was another book I was thinking about as well, World War I book. Um, I don't know, you go and I'll come back to it. Well, I would just say, you know, it's again, it's hard to say because it's such a vast topic. So if, um, if I could get a little bit more kind of parameters, but if I had to, if I had to, so anyway, if I have a topic. Guns of August is the other book I was going Yeah, to. okay. Um, so those are two truly outstanding books. I would need to know kind of where your interests lie, but it, the, I know that the World War One books that I turn to, I will read at least once every year, uh, is um, The First Day on the Psalm by Martin Littlebrook uh, and Death's Men by Dennis Winter. Um, one is a you know, very fantastic history of a battle. Uh, Death's Men is more of a kind of a sociological history of what it was like to, to live in the war. Uh, best one volume history of the war is John Keegan's, in my opinion. Um, but I also really like uh, earlier this year, I read Alexander Watson's Ring of Steel, which was outstanding. So those are my picks. Okay. Um, and uh, Craig says, uh, uh, also any thoughts on two books I recently read, which neither of which I've read, Joseph Persico's 11th Month, 11th Day, 11th Hour, and a memoir by Sidney Rogers in 12 Days on the Sum. I haven't read 12 Days on the Sum, but I have read Persico's book, and I, I like Persico's book. I think it's, it's well written. Okay. You know, it's popular history. It's good narrative popular history. So those are all the questions that we got in advance. So I have to run back and look at the questions we well, have. Uh, no, you had one more. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So oh, I missed it. Yeah, this is from Jeff. Hypothetical. What if King Edward III had been allowed to marry Wallace Simpson and he was one on the throne instead of George VI? Edward had contacts with the Nazis and Nazi sympathies. Would, he have, would that have affected the outcome of the war? Would he have pushed to make peace with the Nazis? Of course, we, of course, he didn't have real power, but the king did not ha did have a lot of influence. Yeah, so so I think it could have made a difference. Um, you know, he's um, uh, he's got a Chamberlain uh, who's meeting with him once a week, uh, and uh, Edward, uh, perhaps if he he was a pretty weak person, but if he had sort of some strength of feeling about this, he could have talked to Chamberlain about uh, 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 sort of staying in. Uh, considering surrender, considering uh, making a deal, not uh, um, giving over the House of Commons to Winston Churchill. Uh, and there was even a time uh, after Churchill is uh, prime minister when uh, Halifax was talking about uh, trying to get Mussolini to intervene and uh, be involved in, in creating some kind of deal where they can they can make a deal with England. Maybe they give away... Malta, or they do something to 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 uh, to satisfy Germany and and make a deal there. And again, I think if the king had been somebody who was clearly pro-Nazi, as uh, Edward the Seventh was, I think that that could have been an issue. Yeah, I would agree. I would say if um, if he is still king, um, we'd all be eating curry versts here in London. <laughs> I, I, I don't. Uh, I finally had a curry burst on my last yeah, what do you think? trip. Uh, not great. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think because, of course, you know, we we especially in America we forget that Churchill's not the government, right? It's it's the it's so. First of all, I don't know that Churchill ever even comes into power, and he if and when he does come into power, he's in a very weak position, right? right. And, and and Chamberlain and there's a lot of right wing and I. I completely Nazi, but there's a lot of right-wing support amongst the British aristocracy. They fear communism. Um, uh, Edward has a lot of soft power, I think, if he comes out in support of what's happening in Germany, then there's a lot of people that would have said, you know something? Fine. Just fine. So, so uh, I noticed in in, in and I will go back and look at some of the earlier questions, but there's a question from uh, Brian Peacock. Uh, he put, throws up asking about the 250th anniversary of the Battle of Lexington tour. Any information you can share about that? 
want to say that we are working to price everything out uh, and come up with a more detailed itinerary. Uh, and we are hoping that before the battle reenactment this year, which I think is in 78 days or something like yeah. that, um, that we'll have uh, everything set up so that people can actually not just express interest in the tour in 2025, but sign right. up for it. And both Chris and I are, are planning on, on being there, although our, our groups won't always be together. So we'll be together sometimes, but at other times, you know, because we 60 people can be too much for places. We'll have to split up sometimes. And we need to know the number so I know how many copies of Robert's biography of George III I need to get so everybody can have a copy and a God Save the King book to go. Uh, the the biography of George III I approve of. The God Save the King book <laughs> I'm not Maybe so not much. So much. We should have some kind of uh, tchotchkes, right? Like no. some sort of bang bang firing at each other tchotchkes or something or, 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 fall, or falling down graphics uh <laughs> from rev rev <laughs> oh. if you don't know what rev knob is please Boy, don't go it. look it up <laughs> it's four shows we did three or four years ago in november and it was crazy uh, somebody asked us early on i saw this question chris uh when did we become americans that was the question I think they're I asking deep. when the word started being used. That's kind of deep. Oh, well, I would say pretty early because, uh, I mean, Columbus is saying the Americas, right? So I would assume that people living, I don't know if people there would have referred to them, or in America, but certainly people, like people looking at, Europeans looking at America could have said, people living in America. Right? I certainly think in the 18th century, uh, second half of the 18th century is when there starts to be considered Americans, starts to be considered, the phrase is used. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's you, you know, people are writing about the Americans versus the crown and stuff. I'm not sure you see that too much before the French and Indian yeah. War. Uh, you see it afterwards. What you don't see a lot of at that point is the phrase, well, you don't see any of, until uh, after 1776 is the phrase United States. You do start to see that in the revolution. Um, and, and I think one of the, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's an old uh, story, but a true story, which is that uh, it really isn't until the Civil War uh, that we would say the United States is. Right. Well, that's one I was going to say. That, it's R. That's one of the things I remember from that Ken Burns series, right? And they were having, I can't, was it Shelby Foote or one of the other historians? He was so, one of the other historians there yeah, uh, who I said that. That's pretty profound, too. Yeah. I'm looking to, for, for some other, uh, Barbara Batista says, this is so interesting and informative. I think we've, we've, we're have we pulling it off, Chris. Uh, yeah. Well, thank right. you, Barbara. We really appreciate it. Rick, <laughs> will send you, Rick will send you that check after. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have some people who have written about your, your tour uh, yeah. in a positive way. Amazing. Uh, so, um and uh, I'm just looking to see if there's another question here. Or yeah, did you want to throw one out? Do you have one just at the top of your head, ready to go? Well, I, I no. Susan no. Yu says, Chris knows about my pigeon obsession from the World yes. War One tour. Yes, we did, a, we did some pigeoning. And there's mm -hmm. other mentions of Susan's uh, uh, pigeon obsession. So we were talking about generals earlier, and um, – we were talking about American generals or talking about World War II generals. And David Picker says, why not Manstein or Guderian? You know, as to uh, who is the greatest general of World War II? Because they were Nazis and yeah. they committed war crimes <laughs> and, and they got their hats handed to them. Yeah, eventually. They're losers. Yeah. So, okay, we'll leave that one alone. So, no, well, uh, I mean, that, that, what do you think? I mean, no, no, I, 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 you know, I agree. Um, so, uh, another question comes up and I'm sure that you have many deep thoughts about this having not seen it. Actually, maybe you saw the movie. Did you see the movie? No, I haven't. No, I, I really like his hat though. I want to get one. So I saw the movie and I thought it was too long. Yeah. And I thought that the, uh, uh, there are some nude scenes in this movie that are just ridiculous. I think they okay. could have just cut those out completely. I understand why they're there, but they are lascivious and ridiculous and and made me laugh out loud in the theater mm -hmm. um uh but it does hew pretty closely to the truth um 
And uh, there was stuff that I just thought must have been made up for the movie that, in fact, is in the public record uh, from the time. And um, oh, what's his name? I can't think of the actor, but he he plays uh, Iron Man. Who is that? Um, Downey, Robert Downey Jr. I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> movie questions for Chris. Rick, what are you thinking? <laughs> I think it's uh, Robert Downey Jr. He's extraordinary in that film. He should yeah. definitely win an Academy Award as, as Best Supporting Actor. He was amazing uh, playing uh, Louis Strauss uh, in that movie. So I thought it was worth seeing, but it was we saw it in the theater. It was, uh, you know, it was it was during the whole Barbieheimer, uh, um, you know, chatter. Uh, we saw both Barbie and Oppenheimer, and I thought Barbie was the better movie. <laughs> so there you go. Sorry. Well, uh, I. I I'm going to, I'm going to, Laurel, I have some questions about our upcoming tours, but before I answer, I was just going to say and shock you, I saw a movie today. Oh, okay. I went and saw Boys in the Boat. Oh, okay. What'd you and, think? Mm, mm, I thought the costumes were awesome. Um, but yeah, that's about us. I, I like went. Boys in the Boat. Well, so, I th well, so. Had you read the book? No. And, okay. and. My wife wants me to read the book. She told me to read the book. I haven't had a chance to. So now I'm going to have to read the book because she says the book's a lot better than the movie. Which is also true. So you've seen the movie? I have. Okay. Did, weren't you bothered by the fact that the boys in the boat go to Berlin for the Berlin Olympics and there's the looming cataclysm of the Second World War happen and not one of the characters once goes, huh, Nazis. Or, boy, this is a little creepy. Or... Hey, who's that guy up there with the funny mustache? It's just like all of a sudden guys are rowing and then all of a sudden guys with brown shirts show up and then they go away. I think that it's not a movie about um, the world situation in the 1930s. Yeah, but how can you not mention them? I, I think that it's a movie. I think as a movie about rowing, it works really well. And as You're a rower, biased because you like rowing. But I am a rower, and I think as a rowing movie, and I've seen a lot of rowing movies that work really wait, badly. Wait, wait, wait. Are, are there a lot of rowing movies? Right? Here? There are other rowing movies. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. There are. There are. Um, so is this the best rowing movie ever? Because maybe uh, I'll go back and see it again. I think in it. That is, I think it's probably the best rowing movie ever. Okay. Um, I thought it was beautiful. It, it the the issue that I had with it um, was that it takes three years of events and compresses them into one year. And I think that's also a, an answer to to your issue. I mean, I think they are really um, really trying to pare down a big story, and and they're really trying to you know they probably shot those scenes. They probably existed and they probably cut them out because it was already too long and they needed to, to make it shorter. So maybe somebody else would have cut them in and maybe that would have made a better, a better film. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they also assumed that you as a viewer would know who Adolf Hitler was and well, would have a point of view about what you thought about Adolf Hitler. I can't imagine that even the people then, the actual original boys in the boats, aren't walking around in Berlin going, wow. Or have some impression of it. Yeah. I, or you just say something, oh boy, those are really snappy dressers. Who's this Hugo Boss guy? You know. Uh, you know, uh, I, perhaps so, Chris. Uh, so this is this is like they, there used to be, was it what was that um that movie show that was used to be on public television when we were growing up? Siskel and Ebert or Yes. Yeah, we, we could be thumbs like up. thumbs up, thumbs, thumbs down. down. Yeah. So. So, okay. so did you say Laurel? I had a question about upcoming tours. Well, she wants to know. I'd like to know about your upcoming tours. What do you have coming up, and what are you doing for D-Day? So, I finally have a schedule. So, I don't know. No, saints be praised. I know it could change, but I have Everybody a schedule. Sold out because you're so popular. Oh no, no. So, oh, what are your future tours? Oh well, I'm doing a, a, a D-Day tour that is sold out. Um, I'm doing a D-Day to the Rhine tour at some point uh, in mm -hmm. August, I think. Um, okay. I'm doing a, a, I think I might be doing another D-Day tour that's a private group. And then mm -hmm. I'm doing um, a Revolutionary War, um, Charleston to Yorktown in the fall. Come on that trip. It's a great, fun trip. We deal with the final campaign of the uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, it starts with the Siege of Charleston where... Um, an American army surrenders to the British 
and it ends in Yorktown where a British army surrenders to the same general who had surrendered to them in Charleston. So and have you arranged it so they leave the lights on in the restaurant when they get to Williamsburg? Did you? You, well, we're going to eat at a different restaurant. Oh, okay. sure. We are not going to make that mistake again. And we are going to have alcohol at the close of dinner. <laughs> that was a fail, but you know what? People no, are your fault. It, it's and, your fault. Uh, I'm glad you remembered it. Thanks so much. You're so welcome. What, what are you doing this year? Well, um, in seven weeks There's or so. so many. I, I imagine that you don't have time to tell us all of them. No, well, in seven weeks or so, I leave uh, for the Pacific trip. Uh, so um, that will be good. Uh, and I'm excited because at the end of that, I'm going to go um, do the Japan extension. And after that, I'm going to go do a site inspection on Okinawa. So nice. I'll be in warm, I'll be in warm places for about a month. Uh, then I have a band of brothers in May. I have the big D-Day trip coming up, um, obviously for the 80th of that. And my trip will be focused on the airborne. So we're going to see some of the same things that you, know, you generally see, uh, but hopefully some airborne sites that that people don't usually get to see. Um, so I'll do that. Uh, then a couple more Band of Brothers in June and July. And then in August, I have another 80th trip I'm excited about. We're going to do um, Operation Dragoon and in the invasion of southern France. Oh, so great. We're going to start. Um, uh, did Saint you let Walt Laramore school. know about that? Yeah, actually, I did. I, I, uh, so start in uh, Saint Tropez, which can't be all bad. Uh, and finish up in the Italian Alps. So, yeah, if you need a if you need a tour director, let me know. <laughs> All right. Uh, then back to Poland in September, um, and then uh, middle of September, when I get back from Poland, I have uh, our first Eighth Air Force trip. The one Woo! that you know, Hanks and Spielberg stole my idea again. You know. Yeah, that's bastards. Yeah. Bastards. Uh, and then in December, we have the 80th anniversary of the Battle of the Bulls. So lots of 80th anniversary stuff. This busy year. year. Busy 80th anniversary year. So it should be exciting. should be fun. And guys, uh, thank you for staying with us this week on uh, yeah. with without our guest, who you know we won't say anything more about. And, but, well, uh, I, but, but I do, I will say, before we sh um well, we did want to have somebody talking out uh, more about um, the role that women played in intelligence and intelligence operations. And oh, so right, we're right. in discussion with uh, Helen Fry, who many of you already know, but Helen's been with us a bunch of times. She's an outstanding author, uh, writes a lot about intelligence and espionage work, et cetera, et cetera. And she's got a new book about women, the history of women in intelligence. And intelligence. And she said that she would love to come back on the show. We actually have time for today, short dates, notice, so. but, but she couldn't do it because she's at a film yeah. festival. And so, yeah. Um, so, so we'll, we'll have, have Helen on. on to talk about this topic. So we haven't forgotten the topic. So stick with And us. next week uh, we'll be taking a break. Uh, I'll be at a World War II conference in Tampa. Uh, so we're going to have an encore episode, bringing back Kevin Hemel to talk about his book, Patton's War, volume two. Okay. <laughs> So that is the fighting in Europe with George Patton in World War II. So if you're interested in that, and I know many people are, because he is the most interesting general of World War II. Yeah, yeah. Come, come check that out. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Shout at us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast. Back us on Patreon and browse historyhappyhour.com. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>